thank you all for joining us this morning. Are you, uh, and special thanks to our speakers, guests, Dr. Joel Moody, Richard Burton, um, Rod, and Enzo, uh, and Kiran, and many others. So uh, the next agenda item is to have Enzo. So I'm here to introduce Enzo Gartano. Um, he is the president and CEO of Infrastructure Health and Safety Association, IHSA, serving the construction, electrical utility, and transportation sectors. Enso has been with the association for over 26 years in a number of different roles before taking on his current role as the president in 2016. Enso is a professional engineer and a University of Waterloo graduate in civil engineering. Prior to joining IHSA, Enso worked in the construction sector with a large heavy civil and road building company from on-site management to health and safety. He has further experience in private development in ICI sector. His position, his passion in helping workplace succeed and helping all workers arrive home healthy and safe every day. It is a great pleasure to have you and so, and for you to share the IHSA's vision and support. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sobe. Thank you very much, Sobi and Sebastian Forrest and all your team. It's fantastic. Uh, I should take a picture from up here. I think we need to get a picture from up here. Okay, second button. Like Rod, I'm going to put my glasses on, I think, here. Oops. There we go. All right. Well, again, thank you very much and appreciate um, the time here this morning. I believe I'm between you and the break, so we'll try to keep things moving along. Uh, focus a little bit on IHSA and also on our health and safety management system activities um, as a focus of the conversation, but I will have a little more conversation on peripheral items. So first and foremost, who knows about IHSA? Hands up. Wow, fantastic. And we are part of a, of a partnership. As, as uh, Joel mentioned, as Rod mentioned, we are part of the health and safety system in Ontario. With us is WSPS. Kieran is here from WSPS, PSHSA, uh, Workplace Safety North, and then two other groups, Workers Health and Safety Centre and OCAL, the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. Has everyone heard of OCAL? Anybody? Okay, I really encourage you to go to their website as well. It's about occupational health and illness issues, um, also about upcoming issues like mental health, stress, psychosocial factors. Um, I'm going to do a plug for them because we've used this tool. Go to stressassess.ca on OCAL's website. Fantastic tool to gauge the culture and the psychosocial stresses within your workplace. Really, really helps you focus on where you need to do a lot of work or where you can focus your energies regarding uh, psychosocial stresses, relationships in the workplace, workload, those kinds of things. So please utilize all the system partners. And again, we also partner up with folks like 4S and other, um, other on the private side to enhance and improve health and safety across Ontario. It's not just about us on the screen, it's about the rest that are also supporting health and safety across the province. So a little bit about certificate of recognition. I know, um, I'll ask another question here today. Who has heard of CORE? Okay, hands up, great. Who is CORE certified? I'm speaking to the, pre, to the converted here, all right. You can test me if, uh, if you see something here that's not what you think it is. So certificate recognition is a, a voluntary national standard. Um, IHSA works with our partners across the country, our Canadian Federation of Construction Safety Associations, in regards to this program, it's owned by CFCSA. We are a partner there. In fact, we're meeting next week on an annual basis and big topic is always core and what we do within it and how we can work uh, in improving it as well for the outcomes of industry and the, um, again, bottom line is getting people home safe at night. So right now, um, it did start up 30 years ago in Alberta and has, again, grown across the country. In Ontario, we have 733 core certified firms that's as of, as of a couple of weeks ago. Within those, um, who's CORE 2020 certified in the room? Okay, a little less hands, but see the hands are still going up. Of the 733, there's about 350 
almost half are CORE 2020 certified, and CORE 2020 meets Dr. Moody's SO standard. Okay, so we won't get into the question just now about the numbers in that program within, within CORE, but we are encouraging those within CORE to continue to move along that road. We also have about 1,700 firms that are registered and working towards CORE certification, which is fantastic because you have 1,700 firms that are working towards a health and safety management system that is validated, it is uh, observed to be working. And within those, guaranteed, there's gonna be a, b a bunch of folks who are in the health and safety excellence program as well. I think, Rod, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's a significant portion of uh, construction firms. How many are there overall? Well, we have 4,600 members, and the construction is solid 30%. 30%. So, of that, you've got about 12 to 1,400 firms in the construction sector that are uh, in the health and safety excellence system. And, and, um, and we know that we serve also, similar to SOBI, a whole bunch of them in the sector. So, cycle one, this is a quick overview of CORE. You do your internal, you get prepared for it, takes you a number of months, we wanna see evidence, right? It's not about saying, hey, I just started three months ago and lo and behold, I'm gonna get certified. It's about sustaining your health and safety management system. It's about saying, this is how we do it, this is how we communicate it out, our staff, everyone's involved in it. We're gonna be prepared for it, it takes a while, and then you're ready to do an external audit. You do the external audit, and then you do have maintenance years after that. What we do on the maintenance years is a maintenance audit, but we are piloting cur currently an option to work on a maintenance action plan. And that means look at what your corrective actions are, where are your gaps in those internal audits, and instead of doing a, a full maintenance audit on an annual basis in between externals, you're gonna do an action plan related to those corrective actions. So we've been piloting that, seems to be successful for a lot of companies who have been more mature in, in the core certification. And again, at year four, or at the beginning of year four, you do your external audit again. So, 14 elements. The great part of these 14 elements, they're common across the country. Um, as well, they are very much aligned with the support or with the categories you'll see in the Health and Safety Excellence Program. So, when, when I know, I think it was a conscious decision that we would look at how do we align the activities within WSIB, within their system on, on the Health and Safety Excellence, and what's going on currently in health and safety management systems. And a lot of, there is a lot of overlap there and a lot of things that are helping to build the health and safety um, management system through the excellence program. And these, of the 35, I think, all of these are aligned with those 35 or so. So why do we even do it? Why are we talking about health and safety management systems? Anybody? Why are we doing it? What's the ultimate goal? Worker safety. So there should be a connection between the effort, the processes and the system, and what's happening at the end of it, which is getting people home at night. And we've seen some studies through UBC, University of British Columbia. Dr. Chris McLeod did some work in BC, Alberta, and then uh, last uh, was Ontario and Saskatchewan, and has found that for companies in core, same sector, same size companies, very two important factors, right? Same sector, same size companies, those who were core certified in Ontario performed about 28% better from a lost time injury perspective than those that did not have certification. That's, that's significant. Similar results in BC, 12% better, 14 in Alberta, 19% in Saskatchewan. The more important element is a 20% reduction, and I should put it on the screen for next time, 20% reduction in serious injuries. For core versus non-core companies, same size companies, comparison, same sectors. Um, so you're comparing apples to apples. And that's the reason that these systems are being promoted, and we wanna build through the excellence program these systems in the companies. Yeah, and again, take a look at the link here. If you're getting the, if you're getting the slides later on, you can Click on the links, look at the research, independent research by UBC. And the other thing we're very proud of last year at our federation meeting, 10,000 firms across Canada now are core certified. So that's another fantastic piece of news. Again, Ontario, we've been doing it for about uh, nine years now. So we're a little bit behind the others, um, but again, overall 
10,000 firms in Canada is a great thing. And it's not just UBC saying it, TTC. TTC was one of the first ones who jumped on board with regards to requiring core certified firms for procurement purposes at the largest size projects. And since 2015, um, they've seen improvements with respect to the incident rates of those contractors working with them. And again, significant numbers, 26% contractor incident rate reduction, injury rate reduction, 54%, and again, investigations uh, or number of incidents requiring investigations down by 49%. This is TTC saying it, and they do a ton of work in very congested areas. My experience back in the industry, doing a lot of TTC work, and uh, again, kudos to them for stepping up as an owner, requiring it, and then following up with data that, that supports the benefits of the decision they made. So a lot of buyers of construction probably thinking, well, why are these buyers all interested? A lot, of, many, many reasons the buyers want to ensure that the people they're employing or hiring and putting out money towards sometime, well, often in this case, taxpayer money is being utilized in a way that gets those people back home at night. And again, kudos to these who have jumped on board and there's many, many more who are coming on board with requiring, again, health and safety management systems in general to be part of the procurement process. So through the um, SOCI program, uh, IHSA was recognized by the CPO as a governing body of auditors. So we have a, a network of auditors that do the audits themselves that gives the credibility and the processes are in place. We have a few auditors here. 4S is also one of the auditors. We see Tom as well. Um, and there's a process that is there for them to, uh, to be an auditor of ours, including competencies, including their experience in order to do those uh, audits in an appropriate manner. We have been holding and started holding quarterly stakeholder meetings. Again, we're trying to get input from the industry and we'll continue to improve that process and trying to look at how, do we, how can we improve the experience from uh, in, in running health and safety management systems, the process, the administration, what is it that we can do easier uh, or to Rod's point, a little bit quicker, a little bit easier, a little bit faster, but yet let's not take the eye off the effectiveness. Has to be effective, has to be valid. Again, we are um, recognized and the one thing that's uh, a little bit different and, and I know it's for both ISO and for, for IHSA, if you do have corrective um, corrective actions that are required in your health and safety management system audit, those things need to be corrected before they're submitted for SOS. So that's the one little qualifier that when you do submit your application, you do have to fill in what are you doing to fill those gaps and, and provide evidence of doing so. So we call it the uh, SOS action plan. Um, again, the submissions, again, about improvement, it's about um, making it easier to get information in. Who has used AuditSoft, the new tool that we've required? Hopefully it's been a positive experience. I know for some it's been a little bit of a, a, a bit of a, a learning curve, but for others, they've certainly come forward and said, look, it's, it's made it easier, it's made it faster for us to do so. Some upcoming initiatives, and I don't want to get too far into this, but uh, core consulting. We're looking at a bit of a model in regards to those partners that we do have around consulting and helping companies get through core. We'll, a little more will come out on that and we're going to continue to work with some providers in, in helping to, uh, to craft that kind of consulting activity. And we are going to look at equivalency requirements for core. Um, right now you can get equivalency to core for an annual, on an annual basis with other health and safety management systems, but we are going to look very carefully to ensure that it's a robust comparison and robust um, review of what we should consider as equivalent. Standards Council of Canada. So, when it comes to equivalencies, and this will speak a little bit about this, you have ISO, who's a, a, again, Core 2020 and ISO are very, very close in regards to what those standards are all about and the requirements. For equivalency, we do require companies to come forward with a ISO, a valid ISO certificate, a current and uh, valid equivalent uh, certificate. Scope has to be the same. And um, we take all this stuff in, but the one critical piece here, and Standards Council of Canada advise us strongly on it, those who are doing the certification audit for those ISO audits should fall under an umbrella of the International Accreditation Forum. Very, very important because as 
Um, as um, Richard was saying earlier, the ministry's not checking, they look at the ISO audits, they're not really checking the background because they, there's verification pieces there that should be in place. IAF provides that oversight. IAF, International Accreditation Form, for the certifying companies, those companies doing the audits, they have checks and balances. IAF has checks and balances over them. So that gives you comfort, just like I just say in the governing body of auditors, gives you comfort about our auditors, same thing. So we will not recognize, I just say will not. So if you're a company going for ISO and you come back to us for a certification under CORE, it has to be an audit that falls under the IEF umbrella. If it isn't, it's coming right back to you. We're not going to look at it. Because we need to know that someone has been overseeing the auditing function as well. You can go to the IEF certification validation or IEF cert search to ensure that the company you're hiring to do your audit is under that umbrella. And if it's not, maybe ask a few questions. So, the Sudbury case, who's heard about the Sudbury case? A few of you? Okay, in a nutshell, in Sudbury, Sudbury hires a, a construction firm, puts out a tender to do um, sewer and water main replacement, road reconstruction in a, in a downtown kind of road uh, area. Hires a constructor, or hires a general contractor, constructor, and they were doing the work. And at an intersection, unfortunately, they were utilizing heavy equipment, a pedestrian crossed into the workplace and was struck by a reversing grader and killed the pedestrian. The constructor got charged, the city got charged, a whole bunch of people got charged with regards to this incident. And in the end, the city of Sudbury took, um, asked for appeals in being classified as an employer and having responsibilities for that incident as well. In the end, um, the standard, the um, what's it called, the Supreme Court of Canada, unfortunately, was equal. They had nine, nine um, justices. Unfortunately, one had to drop out. There was an even draw of four to four in regards to the appeal in, um, re in finding the Ontario, court, the Ontario Court's finding of City of Sudbury being an employer. So it, it held up that Ontario judgment because it was four to four. Saying that, the Ministry of Labour and I don't want to speak for them, but they, they can go after the owner when it comes to incidents that occur and their role in what, um, as an employer, if they have people on site, if they contract with somebody in regards to health and safety. So saying that, a lot of discussion has been going on. There's an increased awareness from a due diligence perspective from the owner side. So you'll see many, many owners now are calling us instead of us going out to them and talking about procurement, they're coming back and saying, how do we secure ourselves? How do we create due diligence in regards to the way we contract work out? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? So there's a lot more work, there's a lot more interest in regards to doing that. Um, so there's gonna be an anticipated increased requirement for validated health and safety management systems within the procurement process going forward. We're gonna suggest that it's not only gonna be the public buyers, it's going to be the private buyers. There was another incident. How many in here are from a manufacturing sector? A few of you? Okay. How many of you just run a plant of sorts and have employees in the plant? So, company has another quick example. I know the time is running. Um, a company had, does a manufacturing, had a problem with a rooftop unit, called in their maintenance contractor. A worker comes in, in, the, in a nutshell, gets injured and wasn't provided the opportunity to lock out that system properly. The company, the manufacturing company, got charged by bringing in their contractor who, who knew what they were doing on that unit, but didn't allow them the opportunity to, here's your lockout, here's your panel, here's the system. They got charged. So it's, it's not only happening in the private sector, it's, it's hap or in public, it's happening across the board. So again, a, a big warning about how to contract and how to do things properly. And that is probably break time coming up soon. Thank you very much. If you do have questions, I'm sure we'll be able to answer them later.
thank you. And so I know we spoke about safety management system. Everybody is talking about coal, ISO, SOCI. Uh, one thing I want all of you to think about is subcontractors and contractors that who are working for you. The Sudbury case is a great example. So if you do have subcontractors and if you feel their safety management system is not up to par, maybe encourage them to seek if they're in construction. Look for coal or ISO if they're in manufacturing or any other uh, industries. That would definitely help take some owners um, and give you some assurance that you have the right people doing the job for you. Thank you.